Hey everybody out there, hope everything's going well. Uh, this sermon I have excitedly called God and the Guitar. And that's because I went to a concert this last week to see my favorite musician, uh, but more on that later. Let's start with a word of God here. Let's start with Leviticus chapter 27, verses 26 to 34. A firstling of animals, however, which is a firstling belongs to the Lord, cannot be consecrated by anyone, whether ox or sheep. It is the Lord's. If it is an unclean animal, it shall be ransomed at its assessment, with one-fifth added. If it is not redeemed, it shall be sold at its assessment. Nothing that a person owns that has been devoted to destruction for the Lord, be it human or animal, or inherited land holding, may be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. No human beings who have been devoted to destruction can be ransomed, and they shall be put to death. All tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. If persons wish to redeem any of their tithes, they must add one-fifth to them. All tithes of herd and flock, every tenth one that passes under the shepherd's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. Let no one inquire whether it is good or bad, or make substitution for it. If one makes substitution for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commandments that the Lord gave to Moses for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. Our next scripture is from the book of Psalms, chapter 150, which is the very last chapter of the book of Psalms. Praise the Lord! Praise God in his sanctuary! Praise him in his mighty firmament! Praise him for his mighty deeds! Praise him according to his surpassing greatness! Praise him with trumpet sound! Praise him with lute and harp! Praise him with tambourine and dance! Praise him with strings and pipe! Praise him with clanging cymbals! Praise him with loud clashing cymbals! Let everything that breathes Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And our last scripture today is from the New Testament. Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as, as I said, last week I went to see my favorite musician of all time, Jack White, in Washington, D.C. Great time, awesome show. Here's a little bit about who Jack White is, uh, if you don't know. He grew up as the youngest of 10 children in Detroit. And both of his parents worked for the Catholic Church, and he was raised very strictly Catholic. He was even an altar boy, so he is deeply rooted in the, Catholic, uh, the Catholic tradition. Jack started playing the drums in the first grade, and they were left behind by his older brothers. He gladly accepted any hand-me-down instrument that his older siblings would give him. And it got to the point that he sacrificed his bed so that he could store all of these instruments in his bedroom. His drum kit and all the other instruments. He realized, oh, I'm running out of room. So he took his bed out of his bedroom and he slept on a piece of foam on the floor. That's how serious he was about his instruments. He was accepted to a seminary uh, preparatory school, not like a seminary college, but a seminary preparatory school, and he thought he was to be a priest. He was going to become a priest, but he didn't think he could take his new amplifier with him, 
So he stayed in public school so that he could stay home and play his guitar. And he started working for an upholstery business. And his mentor was also a musician. His mentor was a drummer. So they started a band together. But since his mentor was a drummer, that meant that he could not play his instrument of choice, which was also the drums. So he was the guitar player for the band. And that is where he started his career as a guitarist. And today he is known as one of the best guitar players of this current generation. But what does any of this have to do with the Bible? I mean, uh, you're like, hey, the dude picked the guitar over his calling to be a preacher. How is this relevant to a sermon? Is, uh, am I not listening to a sermon about God? Well, my wonderful church family, this is a sermon, and it's on dedication and practice. Just as we practice an instrument, we are also to have dedication and practice to God. Jack, he sacrificed his bed to learn to play multiple instruments. And that obviously paid off because he can play every single instrument that he has on his albums. He is so well versed in music history because he's not just a musician, he's also a music historian and he loves music history. Like he just is obsessed with it. And through that, he has made albums that are a mix of blues and country and swing and metal and punk and bluegrass and even some hip hop. He has put all of them on his albums throughout the course of his career. So he is very well versed in different forms of music. Not everyone is truly called to be ministry uh, a minister in the traditional sense. But they can use their God-given talents if they, they dedicate their time and effort into that. Jack's effort, it has definitely paid off. I mean, he has had a very successful career. And he has used his gifts, his God-given gifts, to win four Grammy Awards. That's pretty impressive. He's had a slew of hits, three of which were number one on the U.S. Alternative Chart. Three Platinum Records two gold records, five albums that have reached the top of the U.S. charts and sales, and he has sold millions and millions of records over the course of his career. That's not too shabby for a poor kid from Detroit that was the youngest of 10 children. And he still talks about God in his music. It's not like he has abandoned his faith. The White Stripes song, which was his uh, first successful band, their first hit was Dead Leaves in the Dirty Ground. And it says, And you know why you love at all when you're thinking of the Holy Ghost. Another White Stripes song, that was actually on their last album, uh, Catch Hell Blues. It says, And if you're testing God, lying to his face, you're going to catch hell. That's pretty true, right? I mean, you can't lie to God. You can't test God. That's going to end very badly. In his solo album, he had a song called On and On and On. And it says, I lift up my head and I wonder just who it is calming, calling my name now. I trip on my way and I blunder, my head falling under a blanket of shame. On and on, on and on, on and on, on and on. High and low may I go, but God only knows just where I am going. Also, once again, very true about who God is and how God acts. And then another song from his solo career called Ice Station Zebra. Interesting name for a song. He's a pretty eccentric guy. But it's talking about those who are creators, those that create things. And this is what he says. We're all copying God, copying God. Add your own piece, but the puzzle is God. So he's still very in tune with God. He says the puzzle is God's, even though we are adding pieces of our own creative efforts, that is God's blessing in our lives. So I believe he is where God wants him to be because he has used his gifts to explore creativity, to bring people joy. He brings me a lot of joy. I love his music. He entertains and he's still talking about God. He's not a Christian musician, but he still talks about God in his music. He's very open about his Catholic faith. 
So what does the Bible say about dedication and practice? Well, it's all about stewardship. Using our God-given gifts to praise God and to do his will. As Jack said in Ice Station Zebra, we're all copying God, copying God, add your own piece, but the puzzle is God's. So, as the book of Psalms says, we are praising God using our gifts. And we are to praise God in his sanctuary, according to that last chapter in Psalm. He's done so much for us. Why would we not want to praise him? I mean, think of all he's done for us. On Easter, we learned about the extent of God's love and greatness and how amazing that work is for us. And through those amazing works, we should celebrate joyfully with music, with dancing. What Psalms 150 is talking about, it sounds like a full-on party for God. Seriously, this passage says we should use trumpets, harps, dancing, pipes, strings, and, I quote, loud clashing cymbals. That's some rock and roll right there, right? Think of that on the next hymn, you know? Whenever we're singing our next hymn, think about how we should be singing loudly, with joy, and showing God's place in our hearts. The joy and triumph that comes through that presence in us. The very last verse in the book of Psalms is, Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everything that breathes, all that we have, every breath in our lungs should be praising the Lord. And I believe the greatest way to praise God and to worship Him is to go out and do His will. Especially in the times when it feels like there's Forces of darkness are working against that will here on earth. We live in a very secular age now. An age where it feels like nobody cares about God. Why would I care about God? You know, I'd much rather live for me than live for God. But in those times like this, that's when we especially should go out and praise God by doing his will. By going out and showing others who God is. In Acts chapter 5, Peter and the other apostles, they're arrested for preaching the word of God. But of course, they kept on preaching. They didn't let that stop them at all. So the high priests, they're like, hey, didn't we warn you about this? They said in Acts chapter 5, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. Sounds like they were a little agitated, right? But Peter, you know, Peter who spent the, the entirety of the Gospels just going out headfirst into everything, he said, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And Peter, right in front of everybody, used that very opportunity to share the Gospel. He had matured a lot since the Gospels. He told the chief priests about how Jesus was crucified, mind you, on their command. That's pretty brave, right? I mean, that's showing some guts. How God raised him from the dead and forgave the sins of the repentant. And how they had witnessed all of these things happen. Those disciples, they had witnessed it all. And they are then going out and sharing what they had seen. And for this action, the apostles were flogged, and they ordered to speak of Jesus no more. Now, of course, they did not cease to speak of Christ, but they were only given more vigor in their ministry. And they they went out and they laid the foundation. They preached the very message of Jesus Christ that is what our religion is about today. Their ministry is still in existence today, 2,000 years later. They took advantage of the opportunity God had given them, and they grew in strength from any persecution that they had earned. I mean, I I mean that word. They earned in the name of God. What do we gather from the strength of God? We should go out, and we should look at the big picture around us. 
We should see every single blessing that we have from God. And we should go out and we should take advantage of every single one of those blessings. Let's look at the book of Leviticus and what it has to say about tithing. Because if we are gifted so much, we're called to tithe that. Leviticus 27 verses 30 to 33. All tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. If persons wish to redeem any of their tithes, they must add one-fifth to them. All tithes of herd and flock, every tenth one that passes under the shepherd's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. Let no one inquire whether it is good or bad, or make substitution for it. If one makes substitution for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy and cannot be redeemed. God wanted the best. He wanted unblemished uh, sacrifices, as it says in Leviticus 27, 27. So he wanted the best. So the tithe, that 10%, it can't be a, well, I can spare this one and I can spare that one. No. We tithe our best. God wants our best. God wants our best worship in church. Not just going through the motions, not just a, oh, here I am. Not just mumbling as we sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. No, no. God wants hallelujah, hallelujah. God wants us to put our financial giving at the top of our budget instead of at the bottom. It's not a, well, okay, here's how much money I can give. I know I'm supposed to give 10%, but I think I can only give five today. No, our budget at the top is our 10% tithing. Our tithes are not less leftovers. Our tithes are not our excess funds. And God wants our presence. Tithing's not just financial. It's not just about giving our financial gifts. No, God wants us to go out and work for him. God wants us to volunteer at our church events, our school functions, our outreach programs. God wants us to tithe our time and our talents. If we are blessed with it, then we are called to tithe it. That includes our very selves. If every breath we have is a gift from God, if every day we live is a blessing, then we need to make sure that we are tithing our time and talents along with our finances. Giving our best is referenced over and over again in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 27. Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but one who turns a blind eye will get many a curse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. And then let's go to Hebrews. Chapter 13, 15 to 16. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips that confesses his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is just like practicing an instrument, just as Jack White had practiced so many instruments in his youth. Or it's like a sport. You got to practice a sport to get good at it. Or it's anything we want to pursue. is something we have to practice to dedicate our time to, to get better at. Think about reading. The more you read, the better your vocabulary grows. The more you have good comprehension of reading. The more you shoot a basketball means the more often that basketball is going to go through the hoop. The longer you play the guitar, the better you're going to sound. 
the more you dedicate your time to God, the more fulfilling your walk with him grows. Notice how those verses that I shared there stated that God rewards a faithful servant. Now, I don't want this to turn into the prosperity gospel, you know. the This shouldn't be about how the end goal is to get more blessings from God. No, stewardship is not about us. It's about praising a God who has already blessed us enough. We're already blessed. We are already given so much. But life feels more fulfilling when we put God at the center of that. When we dedicate ourselves to the cause of furthering God's name. To being a blessing to people in God's name. I want to share another story about a person who dedicated themselves to something. And the story of Henry Nowen, it's much more spiritually led than the story of Jack White. I mean, I love Jack White. He is my favorite musician, but... Henry Nouwen's story is much more spiritually led. Henry Nouwen taught theology for 20 years at some of the best schools in our country. He taught Notre, at Notre Dame, go Irish, as you can see, I got my Notre Dame football right there. Uh, he taught at Yale, he taught at Harvard. So, I mean, these are some of the greatest schools in the United States. And in all that spare time, I'm sure he had, he wrote some of the most prominent theological book, theological books of our time. And um, <laughs> all the spare time he had, that was sarcasm. Because if you're being a professor of theology at these schools, you don't got a lot of free time. So this guy was brilliant. He was a hard worker. There's no doubt about that. He was not a slacker to teach at these schools and then to go on to write some of the most prominent theological books of our time. The guy was brilliant. But Henry did not feel fulfilled. He had been a priest before his uh, professor days. He taught future preachers. Wasn't he doing God's will? I mean, if you're a priest, if you're teaching future preachers, you would think you would feel pretty fulfilled, right? That you'd be doing God's will to the extent of your abilities. But as I said with Jack, conventional ministry isn't always somebody's calling. Now, I'm not saying that Henry wasn't called earlier in his career. If he was as brilliant as he was and making as much of an impact as he was, yes, I believe he was called early in his career. But then God called him to something else. So he left his cushy job at Harvard, which is where he was uh, teaching at the time, and he started working at an assisted living community in Ontario, Canada. He said he always felt like something was missing, but the missing piece was found there at this assisted living community. He was 53 years old when he made this change. That's the same age that most people are like, you know what, I should probably really take my savings seriously for retirement so I don't have any financial problems. But here is God calling him and he answered. You know, at 53, he should have been thinking about his bank account, his retirement accounts, but he left this job at Harvard, which I'm sure paid much more, to work in an assisted living community, which probably paid much less, but he felt much more fulfilled. He loved it there so much that he wished to be buried on the grounds of that community, which that community gladly carried out when Henry died in 1996. God wants our best. It did not make any sense for a Harvard professor to go work for an assisted living community at the age of 53. But God wants our best. God called him there. Not our leftovers, but our best. God's not a dog. He doesn't want our table scraps. We need to think about our level of dedication to God. Do we just give our spare time? Or do we go and make time for God? Do we give our best, our first fruits? If we're giving our spare time, that's table scraps. If we are making time in the midst of our busy schedules, that's our best. That's our first fruits. Jack White, he sacrificed his comfy bed to learn how to play music. He was playing the blues at a time when everyone around him in Detroit was listening to electronic dance music. 
Henry Nowen, he sacrificed a cushy career to help the disabled. What do we do for God? Do we donate our first portion of our paychecks? Do we donate our time to join his will? Do we worship with a full sense of thankfulness? Are we good stewards of our gifts and our blessings? Do we give God our first and our best? Remember, God loves you. I love you. Have a blessed day.